Thank you, Andrew. And um, that cardboard cutout's a few years old, so you might need to make one that's a little wider, uh, since I've been eating quite well in Singapore. Um, G'day everyone, it's really good to be here. Uh, certainly good to be in uh, weather conditions where the humidity is down below 90%. Um, and I'm really enjoying the day today. Uh, we're nearly at the end of uh, this, the, the sessions for today. Um, I don't believe there's any questions, Andrew, on this one, but I'll be around after for those who are joining us for a beer at the uh, Sundowners. So I'd really enjoy having a chat uh, with anyone who's got any questions from my presentation. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm in uh, Singapore. There we are, and I manage a, a team that's spread across uh, various global locations. MLA has around 50 people uh, and in around 17 locations, um, from Europe all the way across through mostly Asian locations and then into uh, Washington DC as well. And the reason, the reason that we maintain a, an office network, mainly staffed by local people who understand the culture, the language and the, the food scene, uh, is because the Australian red meat industry is very much an export focused industry. We export uh, red meat to over 100 countries and we export uh, 1.6 million tonnes of red meat last year, which is valued at over $16 billion. So we need to have local people uh, helping develop those markets on behalf of uh, the entire industry. And the, the reason why we need to have local people is because, and promoting Australia, is because uh, country of origin and provenance is absolutely front of mind for the international consumer. Uh, especially in countries where uh, they import a lot of food, countries where they may have had food safety scares before. Uh, your average uh, mum or dad who's shopping for their family in China, in Japan, in Korea and across the world puts a lot of focus into where the product comes from. It's absolutely uh, very front of mind for those consumers because they want to make sure that the product that they're purchasing and feeding their family is safe, healthy and good quality, consistently good quality. And the good news is for us, uh, after decades of developing a presence in our key international markets, that Australia is, has a really, occupies a really strong position of trust amongst global consumers. Uh, when we ask consumers what they think of Australia and Australian product, uh, they often tend to say that they trust Australian produce uh, and they trust its consistency and it's been feeding oftentimes uh, multiple generations of their family uh, in, in a locally important way, cuisine wise. And a lot of that trust in the country is due to our meat products. So I spend more time uh, in supermarkets around the world than I'd care to think about. Um, and often and usually Australian beef or lamb is actually the most prominent product uh, in international markets from Australia that, that can be found. Um, you might find a bit of wine, occasionally some horticulture. Um, Australia is obviously well known from a tourism front, but in terms of tangible, uh, a tangible product from Australia, Australian beef and lamb and sometimes goat in various uh, markets is actually the most um, identifiable Australian product that they can find uh, in their country. So. The Australian meat industry has actually um, really helped build that strong position of trust that, and positive perceptions that we occupy in key markets. But, so that's the good news I guess, but the competition is, is really fierce. I think Australia's certainly been an early mover when it comes to food safety, when it comes to traceability, when it comes to eating quality, consistency, sustainability, all of those things that customers want. But there's plenty of other uh, countries that are trying to attain that same status and that same position when it comes to trust. Um, if you travel to our key markets, you'll often find American beef, you'll find Canadian beef, Japanese Wagyu, um, you'll find Brazilian beef in various markets, you'll find, of course, New Zealand lamb and beef, Irish beef, Uruguayan beef. So, and these are just the country associations. Of course, there's many, many brands that are trying to challenge uh, the position of Australian beef, lamb and goat meat in key markets. So it's a very competitive space that we occupy. So what do we do about it? Well, one of the things that we've got a fantastic advantage in is our market access. I promised the guys I wouldn't put any graphs in this presentation, but I've just decided to put one because it's a really powerful story um, that often gets overlooked, for example, with the media at the moment about the European Union deal falling through um, and China, particularly uh, with suspensions of beef plants, etc. But if you look at this chart, 
and go, sorry, the, the numbers are very small, but if you go back to 2005, we had one trade deal, and that was with New Zealand. Um, so the lines on this chart show you what percentage of our exports are covered by a free trade agreement. You'll see that starting with the US, and then in more recent times with Japan, with Korea, with China, and with the TPP, and not even appearing on the chart is the Australia-UK trade deal that came into effect this year, and a, a, a trade deal with India as well. So we're now in a position where the vast majority of our meat exports are covered by a free trade agreement. The gap that you see there is um, for sheep meat down at 74% is because of the Gulf, with which, who, which we don't have a free trade agreement with, but the, tariff, the tariffs are not prohibitive. Um, so generally speaking, close enough to 100% of the Australian red meat exports are now covered by a free trade agree agreement or some preferential trade deal um, as, a, as a strong trading partner. So that's been a big focus of our team over the years, and MLA has um, worked really closely to coordinate industry efforts towards free trade. Once we have markets open, uh, the main thrust for us is to work with the customers to help identify Australian beef and lamb and goat, uh, and, work with the, some of, and we work with some of the world's largest uh, and biggest and best retailers and food service operators to help them promote Australian product and help make that product identifiable to consumers. So if you walk into a supermarket in Tokyo or Shanghai, you're likely to find on the, on the beef or on the lamb a pack sticker, or on menus you might find a descriptor of Australian beef, Australian lamb, Australian goat. So we work really closely with customers at that demand side end to help pull the product through with them. We also conduct targeted promotions and media, um, increasingly in the digital space, and always uh, in ways which, uh, which align with the local culture and the local media scene. So we have local people who understand the media culture, understand the local consumer base, and we craft uh, campaigns that align with their interests and with the media habits that they have. For example, in China, they don't use, tend to use the same media that we use, but there's live streaming sites that attract many, many hundreds of millions of consumers, and we are aligned with those uh, media outlets um, to ensure that Australian beef, lamb and goat are, are prominently displayed in the, media, um, in the media mix. And then at the foundation level, we conduct uh, trade shows and we work with Australian exporters together uh, to help promote Australian product. So in the last 12 months, uh, the first clean year probably since uh, the COVID restrictions, we've been able to manage five trade shows, uh, major trade shows across the world with Australian exporters. We've coordinated 100 exporter booths and those exporters have reported 1,500 plus leads. So that's a collaborative effort with exporters. The reason that we do that is so that everyone's under one single roof, uh, which means that we're much more attractive to customers who are looking for Australian produce. And then the biggest change for us uh, since COVID, we had an opportunity to refresh the way that we looked at education and inspiration of uh, food professionals. Um, we've always done this as, a, as bread and butter in overseas markets, but less than 12 months ago, we launched a single global program to educate food professionals. That's called the Aussie Meat Academy. Um, and in just less than 12 months, we've already run 300 events under that banner uh, with 19,000 attendees. That's entirely face-to-face, -face. and that is now the, the global program that we use to inspire food professionals to use Australian beef, lamb and goat. Under that sits a couple of ambassador-type programs. Um, so we've got the Aussie Beef Mates. Um, that's a program we just launched this year, and already we have 50 food professionals that we've brought to Australia in partnership with state governments in New South Wales and in Queensland. Um, and those are food professionals who we've identified as people who have passion for Australian beef and would value coming to Australia to learn more about our production systems. And then we utilise those ambassadors back in their home markets uh, for marketing and promotions. These are unpaid ambassadors, but we invest in them and then we, we use the, utilise them in marketing promotions back in their home countries. Closer to home here in Victoria, um, we have the Lambassador Program. And this has really kick-started that ambassador type approach. Um, over the years, we've worked with the Victorian government uh, in partnership to identify global food professionals, once again, who have a passion for Australian lamb that would value coming to Australia, in this case, Victoria, 
uh, and learning more about our production systems and learning from each other. And we also get them on the tools. Um, often Sam Burke and, and Kelly will educate them about MSA and different cuts that they might not be uh, utilising at that time. And then we go back to their home countries and they become a key element of our marketing strategy. Mostly they're chefs, but they're not all chefs. So you'll see on the right hand side of the screen here, the most interesting lambassador we've ever, we've ever had is a, is a mascot, uh, that big rotund uh, yellow and white sheep there. So that mascot is uh, from Japan. It's the, um, the mascot of uh, sheep consumption up in Hokkaido. Very, very popular. If you know the Japanese, you know that they like mascots. And that mascot has a bigger social media following than any of our other chefs that we've worked with. So even mascots, we've had retailers. Uh, recently, we brought down the head of sustainability for Hilton across Greater China, where they have uh, 700 hotels. So we're bringing big shots in, and then we're bringing um, even uh, restaurateurs who might just have a profile and, and one single restaurant, and even inanimate mascots occasionally. Um, and just to, just to reinforce that one, this is about initially educating these people about Australian agriculture. In this case, getting them onto farms, getting them outdoors, meeting farmers, hearing about their passion for industry, hearing about their passion for uh, their animals, uh, the care that they have for the animals and, and for their farms. Also gaining knowledge from some of our experts, uh, some of our butchers, some of our chefs that we work with. Getting them on the tools, because if, if you know chefs, you know that they don't like to sit idly by while watching other people. So we get them on the tools, um, they, we get them ideating around Australian product at the same time, and then we take them back home and they become a key marketing tool for us. So that's been a very successful program that I wanted to highlight because increasingly that's where we're heading in terms of promotion of Australian beef and lamb, is using those experts that we've identified in market um, and investing in them together to promote Australian beef and lamb. Um, as I said, that's a sort of a whirlwind uh, tour of our international program. Um, I'm available afterwards. I'd love to meet some of you over a beer at Sundowner. Um, I'm sure Nathan shares the same sentiment. Um, so he'll be up now to speak about uh, domestic marketing and some of the insights work that we do. Over to you, Nathan. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Coxie. Uh, yeah, and as Coxie said, I'll be around for, for plenty of time after this, so any questions about what I'm going to present in terms of what our focus is for driving demand in both the domestic, retail uh, and food service channels. Uh, happy to talk through more deeply the, what I'm going to share with you. Um, the important thing in terms of um, when we're developing our plans and our strategies in the domestic market is everything is driven off the back of insights and data. And one of the things we talk about as marketers when it comes to driving consumption and consumer behavior is what are the triggers and what are the barriers. Um, and at the moment, the two big prevailing sort of triggers and barriers for red meat consumption, one is very much the cost of living pressures, which is a unique challenge for us, particularly because beef and lamb are the most expensive proteins and carry a significant premium to the other options that consumers have. Um, but value is also a really, really big trigger. Uh, and people see a lot of value in our product. So that works as both a trigger and a, bar a barrier at the moment. And off the back of a pandemic, um, the high importance that was placed on health and nutrition, again, is both a trigger for our product or in an environment where there's a lot of negativity in, across social media and other media channels about the role of red meat in a diet, the importance of balancing that narrative and ensuring people perceive red meat as highly nutritious has been a really important driver of our marketing activity. So on the one around driving nutrition uh, and leaning into that importance of health that consumers uh, have placed when it comes to making choices for what they're going to put on their dinner table and feed their families, we developed the Beef at Your Best campaign. And essentially what we were trying to do here is if the average person on the street is feeling guilty about eating red meat, and that was absolutely happening, that was what our insights were telling us, um, why not showcase the role that red meat plays or the role that beef plays in a healthy, balanced diet by telling that story through people who care more than anyone else about what they put in their body. So for us, this came off the back of having been a sponsor of the Australian Olympic team and then we leaned into using professional athletes to help us to tell the story about the positive benefits of beef. So I'm just going to share a few of the executions from the campaign that we've been running for the last 12 months. 
Uh, I'm Lance Lawson. Around here, I'm known as the General. Come on, Reynolds! Game prep never stops. You know, the right nutrition is essential. That's where beef comes in. Oh, yes, poetry! Well, it's good for muscle strength, too, so, yeah. Full credit to beef. Right, see you, General. Uh, not that one, Adam. The other one. Ah, uh, yep. Sorry, General. Hi, Captain. So that was the main piece that actually set the campaign idea up. And then because there's lots of alternative additional nutritional benefits to beef, whether it's uh, mental acuity, muscle health, etc., uh, we had a series of other executions that allowed us to talk about additional benefits of beef other than it just being a really important source of protein. And this is one of those executions now. I'm Lance, I'm known as the general. For muscle development, you need protein and beef. It's packed with it. I mean, it's unbelievable the strength these players have. All of them. Um, and also because we also wanted to leverage the ability to tell longer form storytelling. So when you're advertising on TV, you're limited to formats that are 60, 45, 30, 15 seconds long. Um, but leveraging our uh, digital channels and social media also allowed us to produce content that allowed us to tell longer stories that were more informative. Um, and this is an execution we did around Iron Awareness Week. Um, and it also allowed us to ensure that there was a gender balance to the campaign. So the beauty of partnering with the Broncos, and I'm very conscious I'm in Victoria and AFL territory. This is definitely not about rugby league or AFL. The Broncos are playing the role of professional athletes in this. Um, we actually tested this campaign in every single state in Australia, and it actually tested just as well in non-rugby league states as it did in New South Wales and Queensland. So importantly, people understood that these were professional athletes who care about what they put in their bodies, and therefore were a really effective vehicle for us to tell the nutritional benefit story of beef. Uh, and this is the iron piece we did with the NRLW team of the Broncos. The toll on the girls at the moment is huge. The collisions are bigger, we're playing more games, so we're having to teach the girls more around nutrition, sleep, all these things come hand in hand when it comes to playing footy. Iron plays an important role in how our bodies perform. It's also involved in energy production and our immune system health. Lean beef is a great source of iron, so getting enough iron in our diet is just as important for athletes as it is for the everyday individual. In the past, we've definitely had some players that have had iron deficiencies that we've had to address. It's all about balance. They're busy being parents, they're busy juggling full-time jobs, and on top of that, trying to be professional athletes and maintaining a really good nutritious diet. An average serve of 150 grams of lean beef will provide the body around 25% of its recommended daily intake of iron. When we're eating lean beef, it's a good idea to include salads and vegetables as well. All of these help our body absorb more iron from the beef that we're eating. And so that campaign we've been running for 15 months now, um, definitely helped in terms of getting additional reach that the Broncos went on a run to the grand final this year, which also then allowed us to lean into that and do some more entertaining, engaging, personable content um, to basically drive additional reach for, for that partnership. What's this front play called? Beef. Beef. Everybody loves our beef. Yes. <laughs> Well, they're all pretty well cut. Corey Oates, he's a sirloin. A showstopper. Lean, super quick, and full of gusto. Tommy Flegler, he's the rump. Excellent bang for your buck. And he'll do the hard yards. Paddy Carrigan, the crowd favourite. Well, he's got to be ribeye on the bone. Full of goodness and the tenderness to match. That brings me to our eye fillet. It's got to be our skipper, Adam Reynolds. They're both highly sought after lean and always deliver given any situation. I reckon the boys would say I'm a kebab. I'm not sure why they'd say that. They're all tasty, beef is tasty, it's beautiful. Um, and also leveraging the popular popularity of the Broncos, particularly within Queensland. So the campaign has been really effective at driving brand perceptions around makes healthy meals, about reducing the number of people who are claiming that they were 
reducing their intake of beef for health reasons. So it's hit all those things, but it also gave us the opportunity to drive some direct volume benefits for industry. So when we signed the partnership with the Broncos, the burgers in Suncorp Stadium, the home of that team, uh, was actually an imported New Zealand burger. We were able to replace that with a 100% Australian beef burger throughout the stadium catering environment. Um, and that equates to about 25,000 burgers a year. We also partnered with Australia's largest hotel group, ALH, through 115 venues um, in, in Queensland and part of New South Wales, uh, with incremental menu items that were themed up from that partnership. Uh, and that premium beef rump steak, which was an incremental item to their menu, sold an additional 35,000 steaks, or what was roughly the equivalent of a million dollars in beef sales over and above what they otherwise would have done. So we've not only driven the nutrition perceptions of beef through this campaign, but we've been able to drive direct volume benefits to industry to pull that supply through the, the value chain. Um, so that's now finished, that campaign's ended. Um, at the end of this rugby league season and we're now very much focused on addressing that other trigger and barrier around value perceptions to address the cost of living challenges that consumers are dealing with right now. So when it comes to assessing value there's obviously lots of different components of that. One of the most important ones is obviously affordability in terms of what is the cost of the meal on my plate, what is happening to my shopping basket, but equally shoppers are also looking for meal solutions that are quick and easy, repetitive, and popular with families. So what we did when we developed this campaign is we actually looked at the most searched recipes on Australia's largest recipe resource, which is taste.com.au. Ten, the top 10 most searched recipes, six of them feature beef, or can feature beef as the protein of choice. So we developed this campaign off the back of those six recipes, which are six of the most 10 popular things people search for when they're planning their meal dinner for the week. Um, and then we featured it and showcased it in a storytelling way that shows how easy and simple it is. Because in the, in the environment we're in now, the important thing for us, particularly for the next 12 months, is to make sure beef is still centre of plate in those midweek meal occasions uh, where consumers are looking for value. And I'm just going to show a series of, of three ads that are part of that suite of six executions we developed in this campaign. You're seeing sizzling garlic and ginger. You're seeing crisp green veggies and golden noodles coated in oyster sauce. You're seeing a 15 minute stir fry and you're thinking beef. You're seeing a white bean puree with lemon juice and garlic. You're seeing green beans, seasoning and a char grill pan on medium heat. You're seeing steak and three veg and you're thinking Beef. You're seeing a stack of warm tortillas. You're seeing shredded coleslaw, spicy mayonnaise, and fresh lime. You're seeing Tuesday night tacos, and you're thinking beef. So one thing that hopefully you appreciate and, and can see in these executions is that we're still presenting beef in a way that looks premium and looks great and has all those important food and cuisine cues because importantly value doesn't mean cheap. Actually having a premium perception and having a perceived higher quality versus other protein choices is a really important component of driving value and when you couple that with ease of preparation and being a family favourite it increases the probability that people are going to choose to put beef on the centre of their plate for their midweek meals. Um, we also pull this campaign th right through the retail channels uh, around recipe inspiration and the use of QR codes so that people can download recipes to make these meals. Uh, we also partner with complementary products around retail point of sale because it means we don't have to spend all of our money. We can actually spend some of Mars's money in the case of Master Foods um, or in partnering with Old El Paso around Mexican cuisines, etc., which just drives a better ROI for us because it means we can use those levy dollars for other things as well. Um, so really pulling that recipe inspiration and visibility through ins into store, as well as reminding people as they're entering the supermarket with some point of sale outdoor advertising there, just to trigger their mind back to the campaign so that beef stays top of mind for those everyday midweek meal occasions. Um, then what we've also done this year on lamb, and this is the first time we've done this for a few years. Um, so obviously everyone knows the iconic summer lamb ad, 
Uh, and then we'll usually have a couple of bursts of activity at other points of the year for lamb. But we've actually come out really strong this year in spring, particularly with the spring flush. And obviously we are we're very conscious and aware that there's a lot of supply in the system at the moment. So we've upweighted our investment behind marketing in the last three to four months of this calendar year. Uh, we partnered with Marion Grasby, who's an ex-MasterChef contestant. The good thing about featuring her in this advertising is she also brings her own audience. So by featuring her, she also shares the content with her one million plus followers on social media. And that's reach that we don't really have to pay for. It's incremental over and above. Um, the media spend we're investing. So I'm going to show you a couple of the executions that we did. Feedback from stakeholders was also, we, we always feature the hero lamb cutlet and summer lamb each year, and feedback was very much showcase more cuts, more diversity of lamb, and we've tried to do that with this campaign, as you'll see in these next two ads. These lamb chops are destined for my outdoor grilling party. Just need to do some grilling. Lamb chops, the perfect way to entertain this spring. Say more with lamb. 30 minutes to make a spring lamb recipe for my family. Challenge accepted. Lamb steaks, the perfect way to entertain this spring. Say more with lamb. So like we've done on beef, we also then pull that through with recipe inspiration, resources, educational resources for consumers, retail point of sale, to keep lamb top of mind as people are entering the supermarket, particularly in that spring period. Uh, so that's kind of where we're up to now uh, in terms of present day, what's happening in the market. Um, so the good news for red meat demand for both beef and lamb is that actually all of the indicators are up. Uh, so more households are buying into lamb. Beef household penetration is already relatively high. Um, so these are the quarterly numbers. On an annual basis, lamb is still in the mid-70s and beef's in the mid-90s. But on a quarterly basis, every 12 weeks, uh, an increase of 1.5% more households have bought into lamb in the last quarter. Beef's maintained its position as relatively high. But as we've seen retail prices start to come down, the good news is that volume has increased above that rate, which means overall value sales of both beef and lamb is up in the latest quarter, which is a vote of confidence for our product. People still continue to love it. And the headline I'd like you to remember is more people are buying our product, more households more often, and more quantity, and they're spending more dollars on it and not just consuming more volume. So the outlook is incredibly positive. Um, so what's coming next? So one of the things we've done between now and Christmas, so this is normally quite a quiet period, um, December is usually in a retail environment owned by ham or by pork with Christmas hams um, but we know the retailers are driving beef and lamb pretty hard it's in catalogue more than it usually is this time of year there's plenty of supply in the system um, so on Monday this week we actually shot an ad that will run throughout December um, that features uh, AFL legend Lambassador Sam Kekovic uh, NRL uh, legend, ex-Brisbane Bronco, Sam Thiday, essentially delivering the message of producers have done an awesome job, there's lots of supply, get out into the supermarket this summer and load up on beef and lamb for your barbecues. Um, so we're going to drop that next week. Anyone who's subscribed to any MLA media channels, you'll all get a press release around Wednesday, Thursday next week with the finished content and we'd love for everyone to share it on their own social channels as well because we all want to do our bit to move as much volume as we can on both lamb and beef between now and the end of the year. So we haven't done something like this before. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how it works and have a really strong December which is historically a month where we under index versus the other proteins. And then off the back of that, I'll click over this because you probably all saw last year's lamb ad. Um, but last week we shot 
this year's LAM ad, uh, which will drop in the first week of January. Uh, there's a few clues in the images there as to what this la year's LAM ad's about. But what we do every year is we take something that's dividing Australians, that's a topic of conversation, uh, and we showcase LAM's role as being the protein that brings people together to settle their differences and share, o share it over a LAM barbecue. So I think we've got a pretty cool idea this year. I think it's pretty big. We've got some great partnerships, particularly on the food service side that will make this year's campaign have even broader reach and broader impact and pull it through even stronger through sales channels. Um, so we're really, really looking forward to this drop, dropping in the first week of January. So, so watch this space. Um, just like we do on the consumer side, we also take an insights and data-led approach to our food service strategies. Um, and there's three big triggers and barriers that are impacting decisions around featuring red meat on menu throughout the food service industry at the moment. One is the rising cost of goods. Um, so obviously right now actually they can procure the red meat at cheaper prices than they could previously, but their cost of labour, their cost of rent, the cost of their utilities, etc., is still continuing to go up. So the cost of running a restaurant at the moment has never been higher, so they're looking for efficiencies on menu. So that's a really important insight that when Sam Burke and the rest of the team working across food service are talking to restaurants and, and food chains, that we're helping them resolve that tension and that challenge with red meat on their menu. Also helping educate them because they're dealing with unskilled labour, they're struggling to get labour, the labour is quite transient, they don't keep staff for long periods of time, so often you've got relatively untrained staff cooking a $45 steak, so we need to make sure a consumer is having the best possible experience when they're paying that much because the other challenge is in a cost of living crisis, diners' expectations when they do go out and are spending $50, $60, $30, even $35 on a main, that's a lot of their disposable income. Their expectations have never been, a high, been higher, so they need to have a great experience every single time. So we invest a lot of time through our business development team, uh, through our butcher, Doug Piper, through our corporate chef, Sam Burke, and his team, um, really partnering to understand the challenges in food service and helping inspire them, inform them, educate them and partnering with them to maximise the amount of red meat that we're featuring on menu. Um, one of the channels we do that, I'll skip over that video in the interest of time, but one of the channels we do that is through is our rear medium channel. Um, so if anyone wants to check that out, you can, you can Google rear medium or go on social media and look for rear medium and rear medium academy, which is all our inspiration and educational audio-visual resources. We publish a quarterly e-magazine which reaches 22,000 food service professionals, which are largely chefs and head chefs, that inspire them around how they can innovate their menus. And the social channels for Rare Medium has, an, has a full reach of 12 million people a year, or 12 million impressions. Um, so it's not targeted at consumers, but consumers can actually follow and, and like it, particularly those high-end foodie consumers. But it's largely focused at food service professionals to help them deal with the challenges uh, that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, and we also produce resources like Red Meat Eats, which uh, if you go on YouTube and you search for Rare Medium Rare Meat, Red Meat Eats, you'll see a little inspirational video that we've put through of all the latest high-end food service trends that will trickle down through uh, the food service system and into pubs and clubs and, and quick serve restaurants. Um, so it's a really important activity that we do to inspire Rare Meat, Rare Meat on menu. And you're going to hear some of that from Sam Burke next when they're doing the carcass demonstration, because he'll talk about how we've used some of those cuts and actually got incremental menu items with certain partners that we've worked with in the food service space. Additionally to that, uh, and very conscious we're, we're in Victoria, so I'm playing to a home crowd here, um, but one of the challenges for lamb that isn't really a challenge for chicken or beef is it historically hasn't been featured as a key menu item in quick serve or fast serve environments. So we partnered with the MCG and their catering uh, partner Delaware North to launch a specific lamb outlet at the MCG on the Boxing Day test uh, in 2022 to showcase the different things you could do with lamb in that environment. Um, and I'm proud to say that not only was it incredibly successful throughout all of 2023 that it stayed there for the whole AFL season, is that it's been renewed for another year uh, in 2024. Um, and next year, we're also going to roll out a similar concept with beef and we'll be launching a premium beef outlet at Suncorp Stadium and leveraging our partnership with the Brisbane Broncos to showcase things you can do on beef in a quick serve, fast serve environment 
beyond the simple standard burger. So if anyone's up in Queensland next year, go to Suncorp and check it out. And if anyone's in the members uh, at uh, the MCG, go and check out the lamb paddock. But now I will hand over to chef extraordinaire Sam Burke and butcher extraordinaire Kelly Payne to do a Takaka's demonstration and while doing that, talk you through some of the innovations we've done in the food service space using a much broader variety of cuts of meat that help address some of those triggers and barriers and challenges that food service professionals are facing at the moment. Thank you very much.